Hi, um, my name is Ted, and um, as you just heard, I am, um, I'm a storyteller turned um, investor. Uh, so seven years ago, I took the step from building my own products and my own companies to start investing in, uh, in companies. So um, today, I'm talking about how to pitch your company, and I figured I would use uh, my company as kind of a metaphor or a story anchor for, um, for this presentation. Um, and my company is actually a part of an even larger company. Uh, I was part of setting up Equity Ventures, which is a, uh, uh, a VC, uh, but also the VC arm of, uh, of EQT. And EQT is, uh, is one of the largest private equity companies in the, uh, in the world, more than 1,100 people. Um, when I joined seven years ago, we were 250 people. So I think it's almost like a startup journey we're on in, in scaling, blitz scaling uh, investing. Um, we're now the th world's third largest tech investor uh, combined with our growth fund and, and mid-market fund and equity fund and, um, and so forth. Um, and on the venture side, we invest in uh, traditional tech companies like Volt. We're in Finland after all, so I have to, to plug Volt where we le uh, led the Series A, an amazing exit to DoorDash uh, a couple of weeks ago. But we also do an increasing number of deep tech investments. So companies uh, with purpose-driven founders uh, approaching maybe slightly larger problems that we're facing in front of us. And as, as mentioned, I figured I would use uh, our own pitch as sort of an anchor for this, for this presentation. So just like you, we also have to, to, to pitch to investors. And the investors a VC fund pitches to are um, various types of institutional investors, sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies, family, family offices and stuff like that. I think the main difference is that when we raised our first fund, I think we had more than 300 meetings with investors to bring in our first fund, which was 570 million euros. The second fund went a bit faster because we had more track record and we had some nice exits and stuff like that. But still meetings in the, I don't know, 70, 80 or so, uh, so meetings. Um, in the end, we, we closed the uh, 660 million euro fund after, I think, six months of fundraising, something like that, which I think should be considered pretty fast for such a large uh, fundraise. One big caveat here was that we closed this fund in 2019, before COVID, obviously. And it's interesting to see how the format of pitches uh, have evolved. Uh, back then, I would say that most presentations, the really good ones, were pretty visual. They were designed to be enjoyed on a big screen like, like this. But now we present or pitch more and more via Zoom. So it's as if this kind of like display format idea, visual speaker support with slides like this, and, and the leave behind uh, in, in the venture world that's called the private placement memorandum with slides like this, have kind of merged into a new type of presentation, a new type of format, which is visual, but it's, it's designed not to be enjoyed on a big screen behind a conference uh, table, but on your screen in front of Zoom. So that's kind of interesting. Um, with that being said, uh, here are five principles or, or learnings that we have iterated upon and evolved while uh, developing our own pitch and also seeing, I don't know, hundreds, thousands, not millions, but at least maybe tens of thousands of pitches from people like, people like yourself. The first one here is about establishing rapport. So the first thing you do when you enter the room with the investor, the physical room or the, or the virtual room. And one piece of advice here is that we're human beings too. I mean, a lot of uh, founders have rehearsed their pitch so much so they go in and they're just like, come on, let me start pitching. So you kind of forget the person on the other side of the table. I, I think those first minutes in a Zoom call or in a room, when you, I don't know, tell a joke or try to figure out if there is some kind of joint passions or something you, 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 you share, you went to the same school or something. I think that's extremely important, that small talk. So even if you prepare the pitch, you know exactly what you're doing, take that time. So, in the presentation, I think you could use the same trick. So I call it three nods to lower the guard. Uh, I've heard other people refer to this as the yes slide. So the idea is to, to start the presentation with something you agree upon. And sometimes you don't know, like, who is this investor on the other side of the table? What do we agree upon? But there's always something. I don't know, the weather or that something that happened yesterday is crap or, or, or whatever. But if you use this, 
kind of like as an anchor, you nod, you agree on something, then you can use that force and take the investor kind of like on a, on a mental uh, journey onto uh, deeper waters where you might not agree. So in the end of the pitch, the investor might have changed their mind about something that you are, you're presenting. And when we raised Equity Ventures 2, the second fund, the, these three nods were about the macro climate. So we started to talk about that the digital transformation is touching everything we, we see, and we're only in the beginning of the digital transformation. So kind of like agreeing upon that everything that can be digital will be digital. Not very controversial. It's something that everyone can, can, can agree upon. Then we anchored around talking about how hard venture capital as an asset class is. We know that a lot of investors into VC funds, they think about this. So if we say it first, it's kind of as if you have like a checkbox. It's as if we as investors or investment managers understand their perspective as well. And then the third one was kind of dynamic. So when I, uh, when I met with European investors, I was talking about how amazing European tech is. When I met with Asian investors, I, I, I spoke about how amazing Asian tech is and so forth. So the third one was kind of, kind of dynamic. So this might seem kind of weird. Why, why are we dedicating time to talking about things we already agree, on, we agree upon? We're, we're here to talk about new stuff. But I think this is kind of like an important psychological anchor to take the investor, whomever you're presenting to, on, on, on a journey, on a mental journey, journey towards deeper water. And looking at this kind of slide view, um, we dedicated quite some time to, to this anchoring or sort of agreeing to, to, to agree. Um, so that's the macro chapter in this, in this presentation. So that's the first one, three nods to lower the guard or, or the yes slide or however you wanna, you wanna do it. Then the second one is also pretty obvious, tell a story. But there are so many pitches that we see that are just a bunch of fact glued together in a, in a presentation. And it's, it's kind of interesting to think about how, how, we, how we think about information. It's as if we group information together in a sequential order, even though there is no sequence. That's just how we operate. I, I, I like this quote. We are, as a species, addicted to stories. Even when the body goes to sleep, the mind stays up all night telling itself stories. So stories are extremely powerful. And even if the story is simplifying your product or your offering or maybe even exactly what happened, I think that's fine. Piece together these things into, into a story. With, with Equity Ventures, we were inspired by um, the hero's journey or the, uh, the monomyth, which is this archetypical story that, that, that we see both in these sort of holy scriptures and, and in, in, in entertainment. And it's interesting how similar this story is to the typical startup story. It's, it's, a, it's a hero, the founder, going out to, to change something into, into the unknown. And there's often hardship. There are mentors on the journey. There's transformation. And then it circles back into, I think it says, gift of the goddess. I don't know exactly what that, what that means. And I think this can be applied onto everything, to, to a pitch, to a presentation. And I, like many visual storytellers, I, I, I was pretty obsessed with Steve Jobs' way of, of presenting. And I, I, I started looking into who, who, who crafted his his magical and very iconic uh, keynotes. And I, I stumbled upon this guy who, uh, who worked with Steve Jobs at Apple, but also at both Next and, and, and Pixar. Um, his name is uh, Wayne Goodrich. And this is what he says about the story arc of Apple's keynote presentations. What few people realize is that, just like Pixar movies, there's a color scheme throughout the 90 minutes, an emotional ramp and yes, there are heroes and villains, action sequences, humor, and plot twists. You have to be careful not to wear the audience out. You have to manage the building to a climax. And Steve understood this better than anyone else. So I think it, like, in, being inspired by movies and books and stuff like that, even if it's a boring pitch that you're presenting to investors, is kind of like an interesting twist. This is a format we use for Equity Ventures. It's kind of like a like, like lighter or easier or more bootstrap version of the hero's journey. We talked about a premise or a goal, like the point of the story, protagonists, obstacles, transformation, and, and, and mentors. And for Equity Ventures, and this was actually not for the second fund, but already for the first fund, uh, this story that we were telling is a story about how Europe is happening from a tech perspective, how, about how Europe is now. The protagonist, of course, being the entrepreneur, the ob obstacles being the lack of European smart capital, 
could argue maybe that that changed now. There is a lot of European smart capital. Transformation that this shift is happening now, and, and equity ventures as a catalyst, and then the mentors, of course, being us and the advisors we have, we have around the table. Another thing I'm, I'm sure you've, you've heard about is, is, is this. Start with, with why or start with your, your, your purpose. And, and um, this, of course, is Simon Sinek, who, uh, who, who made a very, you know, very famous TED Talk, I think, soon 15 years, years ago. But it's, it's starting to become mainstream uh, only now, which is kind of interesting. So in the beginning of the presentation, don't be afraid of, of, to talk about your ambition. Especially technical people sometimes think it's scary to talk about ambition, because what is an ambition and what is a lie or what is sort of truth from that perspective. But I think it's fine to project your ambition out into the future early on. And one thing I really like in Dex is when the founders have like a picture from when they, when they got going on their thing and, and, uh, and talk about the, the moment when the idea came or the origin story or when they experienced the problem themselves or, or something like that. So start with why. And if you haven't seen it, watch this, uh, this TED Talk. Even though it's uh, tw 12 years old, crappy sound, it's still worth, uh, worth a look. So looking at, at the um, sort of layout or the, um, the balance between slides, that one is here, not super uh, prominent. For us, uh, we realized that we, we were communicating to so many stakeholders, we decided to piece together this story or this journey uh, into something we call a mother story, and we got external help to do this. So this is our internal mother story about how Europe is now, and we... Um, we talk about uh, how, how we ourselves were once founders and, and introducing what we do and blah, blah, blah. And it's kind of, kind of good to have a document like this. This is not external. Uh, so this is something we use internally. And then we can take pieces and bits and stuff like that and, and put into presentations and stuff like that. We spent quite some time on aligning around this. So that's the second point about telling a story. Also obvious, but a lot of people forget about this. Um, third one, make it visual. Um, tell it to me like I'm a smart five-year-old. Um, this is what many slides still look at, especially internally at EQT, where we're working with McKinsey and BCG and, and stuff like that uh, a lot. Um, you know this. I mean, this is not how human beings work. This is like a snooze, snooze fest. So keep it simple. And I've always been inspired by, by news graphics. I mean, this is very American and very glitzy. But if, if, if CNN can make something as boring as polls for an election interesting, of course, we, we, we can too. Because startup journeys are, are interesting and, and, uh, and engaging. And for Equity Ventures 1 and 2, the two fundraisers, we, we worked a lot on a couple of visual metaphors to tell the story. And one such visual metaphor was about us having the opportunity to not just invest in seed or Series A or Series B, but because of our big fund and our multi-state strategy, we could, we could invest throughout. So we, we used this as, as a visual metaphor, kind of weird with a with baseball player for a European fund maybe. But then we were talking about how we get three swings of the bat before we're out. And this is one of those, one of those um, slides or visual metaphors that really stuck. And I usually ask that after I present something. So tell me that, like the top three slides that stuck in your mind for some reason. And it's usually the more visual ones. It's where you don't try to cram too much into, into them. And this can go the other way uh, uh, as well. So in, in the first fundraise, we had the, the very famous Mike, Mike Tyson quote about that everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And we had this video behind it. And you could see how the investors just like, ah, they didn't want to look. Just like too strong of a negative reaction. So we realized after three or four presentations, we got we to kill this, uh, this video because it hurts. Uh, so we replaced it with, um, with this one. And then also when, when choosing your visual metaphors, making them a bit absurd usually makes them, makes them stick. So sometimes when I present, and you, there are so many people and so many names, I'm sure you maybe already forgot what my name is, but here it is. My name is Ted. Ted on a TED Talk stage with Ted Danson behind it. Now you'll remember. So those absurd combinations, piecing stuff together, often makes things, uh, makes things stick. So make it visual, that's the third one. Number four is, uh, is iterate, also pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, but people forget about this. They start creating their, their deck uh, like a week before they're pitching. And of course that deck won't be, won't be good. I mean, have, have a deck, 
if you're racing a Series A, you have the C deck, iterate on that deck and try to keep it up to date. Um, for, uh, for our journeys, I think uh, for the first fund, we had more than 140 iterations of the same deck. And for Ventures 3, 2, sorry, we had more than 43 versions of, of, of the same deck. And ba back to Apple, maybe also more for, for later stage companies. If, if you're the founder, it shows if you created the presentation, if you really know the slides. Back to Steve Jobs, apparently he created his own decks, which a lot of founders don't do, especially around Series B and onwards. And then it's just like you're in a room with, it becomes almost like a PowerPoint karaoke, which is not what this is about. And uh, yeah, some, some, more, some more Apple, uh, I guess. Uh, one more thing, saving the best for, for last. In, in our fundraisings, um, this was kind of like the main menu, our strategy, or our four pillars. We're talking about how we're purpose-driven when we invest. We talk about how Equity Ventures brings scale. Uh, we have like radical support through our operating partnership. And then that we're data-obsessed. And this data-obsessed piece, that's when the, when the investors closed down their laptops, stopped looking at their phones, and really leaned in. And you could really sense that this was what they were, uh, had been waiting for. Uh, in, in our sense, it's that we have an internal 25-person development team developing our own AI-enabled tooling for us to find good, good startups. For you, it can be something completely different, but figure out what that extra thing in the end of the presentation could, could be. Um, Mother Rain, we, we developed it in, in 2015. We can do all sorts of cool things with it, uh, all data sets and data sources and, and, and stuff, like, stuff like this. And, and I think this chapter, and, and if you, if you uh, sort of create the story arc so it feels like the presentation is almost over, and then you do this thing in the end. I think that's very, very, very powerful. And looking at it here, that's this, that's this chapter. Um, so that was one more thing. Um, here you have them, the, um, the five commandments or observations or, or learnings. So the yes slide or three nods to lower the guard. Tell a story, of course, make it visual. Don't, don't start the night before you're, 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 you're pitching to your best, the investor you, you, you want, because then you will fail. I mean, this takes time. And then, uh, and then one more thing, of course. And speaking about one more thing, of course, I had to have a one more thing in this presentation as well. Uh, so I figured I would, I would share with you the 10 or 11 pieces of advice we give our portfolio. So after we have invested in a company, and when they're going out to fundraise again. So this is something that we have. It's kind of like our fundraising playbook, if you want. And this is kind of stupid for me as an investor to, uh, to sort of give away, but, uh, but here it is. Uh, I think there are 11. And the first one here, of course, is that you're always fundraising. Um, build relationships early, and uh, preemption is the holy grail. I mean, if someone, some investor comes to you before you're fundraising and you get a term sheet, that is the most amazing way to get more, more investors engaged in your, in your fundraise. Do your homework, said it before. Uh, build your story. Um, get feedback from existing investors. So when you're halfway through or you have something that you like, then you force your existing investors to, to, uh, to pretend they're new investors and, and give, you, give you feedback. Uh, build your investor long list and prioritize that long list. These are the investors I want. These are investors that I would accept. Uh, and then you start from the start from the bottom. So you practice on the long tail, and then you iterate, so you get feedback. And the best thing here is if you practice on the long tail, like the investors you don't want, and you get a term sheet. That's the best, because then you can use that term sheet to get term sheets from your, your best investor. So start from the bottom, and don't forget the pers about the person on the other side, side of the table, as I, as I spoke about early, early on. Um, then when you've done that, you engage with your preferred list, so the top of the list. Um, and, and here we realize that intros, if, if, if a founder in our portfolio wants an intro to another investor, it's way better if that intro comes from another founder. Because if we make the intro to another investor, like, yeah, what is this turd they're trying to pass us? But if it comes through one of the best uh, performing portfolio company CEOs, then it's like, oh, holy shit, let's put stuff aside and let's really, really work on, uh, on this. So intros via entrepreneurs are way stronger than intros via other, other investors. Then, uh, then this one is kind of like mimicking the way TV chefs work. So let's say you start engaging with, a, with, a, with an investor. And then you say, we believe that in a couple of weeks' time, in two weeks' time, 
we will hit these targets. Maybe you already hit them. And, and then what you do is that you feed the investors with, with uh, reinforcing information, uh, dropping nuggets. So they're like, oh, these guys, they're, they're, they're really delivering on what they're, what they're saying. And I think this can be very powerful. A bit harder now when, when fundraising processes are so short, but I, but I still think you can do it, and especially as you bring rela uh, build relationship with, with, uh, with investors. Um, number six, get an early backstop term sheet, no matter wh whatever the terms are. So if you have a term sheet, you have a term sheet. And you know, VCs operate according to their, in our case, Monday meetings. And the hottest deals are covered in the Monday meeting. If you have a term sheet, is, if there's a company that you have like, looked at or something like that, and, and, and that company gets a term sheet, that's when you zoom in, and, and that's when that company is becoming hotter. And it's interesting to see like, how information spreads from VC to VC, where in many cases in the junior ranks, people start trading information. So if, if something is considered a hot deal in one VC's Monday meeting, it will spread. So the next, next week, more and more VCs. So it takes maybe three weeks, if you're doing this right, to be on sort of everyone's, uh, everyone's lips. And you use this to create momentum, and then you use that momentum to get your preferred investor on the hook. And you use that backstop term sheets and the nuggets dropped to, uh, to get on the hot list of, of the VC. If US funds are on the radar, then this is when you go. You say, sorry, now it's hard to travel, obviously, but sorry, I can't take any meetings right now because I'm in Silicon Valley. And then all VCs in Europe freak out. Um, and then number nine here, I hate this one, heard the VC. Uh, so you're the one enforcing deadlines. You're the one saying, we accept term sheets here, and blah, blah. But don't overdo it, because if you overdo it, and you say, I'm expecting term sheets on this date, and you get no term sheets, then the fundraise is, is kind of over. Then it's not a hot deal um, anymore. But do in enforce deadlines and be a bit strict. Make the VCs dance a bit. And then the 10th one here is on, on advisors. Um, generally speaking, if, if we get an intro through an advisor, and it's not like a Series B or a Series C fundraise, we're, we're a bit like, OK, but can't the CEO or the founders fundraise themselves? Why do they need, do they need an advisor? And then you put, put that fundraise into a different, uh, different lane, a, a, a worse lane. And for some reason, this is not entirely true in France. In France, advisors has a different status. Um, and then the, uh, number 11, the most important piece of advice here, don't put a date on the cover page, God damn it, because no one likes uh, old milk. We see this in many, many cases. It's, um, it's, November, it's November still. It's November, but it says September on the cover page. Okay, this founder has been fundraising for, for, for quite some time. And it's just such a stupid way to, to start a presentation on the first slide saying that we're not a hot company in a very subtle and stupid way. So don't, don't have any dates on the, on the cover page. Three books I think you should read, uh, Designing for Emotion, which is a very very short book, I really like it. And then this one might not be super relevant anymore, but uh, Win Bigley, Scott Adams, you know, the founder of, of Dilbert, he was talking about how, how Donald Trump actually is or was uh, a pretty decent storyteller. And then, yes, uh, uh, Cialdini's um, very famous book about uh, influence. He also has another book called, uh, called, called Influence. And then another uh, resource that I, I think is great. This is... Uh, uh, a template for, uh, for a seed deck that um, a, a VC called J12, uh, Stockholm-based, created. Uh, Luca here used to work for Ecot Adventures before, and he has on his first slide uh, the yes slide there as well. So I think this is a great, uh, great, uh, great template. So with that, that was my 57 slides in uh, 23 minutes. Thank you.